So thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to be here to give this keynote presentation today. It is my pleasure to talk to you about ultrasound image formation in the deep learning age. So many of you are familiar with ultrasound. It's ubiquitous in the clinic, and this is a standard clinical setup showing a sonographer holding an ultrasound probe and viewing an ultrasound image on the screen. Now, the first medical image was created in the 1950s, and in the 60-year history of ultrasound, the fundamental signal processing has remained the same in the sense that images created with this setup shown here all rely on the fundamental beamforming step. By the end of this talk, I hope to give you a greater appreciation of the ultrasound image formation process and the beamforming process, where we start with raw data that looks something like this, and we pass it through beamforming in order to achieve the image that the sonographers see on the screen. And then we might be interested in applying some additional post-processing to extract structures of interest, such as image segmentation. Now, the deep learning community has traditionally applied deep learning algorithms to the beamformed image in order to segment structures of interest. What I'm doing that's new and different is I'm starting with the same raw data and I'm bypassing the mathematical component of image formation and replacing that with deep learning in order to segment a more easier to interpret image. The key questions I'd like to get us thinking about throughout this keynote presentation and beyond is first, how can we start with the raw data and combine multiple image enhancement methods and segmentation options in one step with the assistance of deep learning? Second, can we use deep learning to fundamentally improve the presentation of today's images? And I explore these questions with the overarching goal of simplifying clinical procedures, Enhancing, imaging, enhancing image interpretation, and ultimately enabling more widespread use of ultrasound that may, uh, by those who may have less training with interpreting the images. So all in support of improved patient care. So for the remainder of this talk, I'll give you a brief overview as to why these are critical questions for us to be thinking about, and then I'll transition more to tell you more about the beamforming process and then I will talk about our deep learning approaches to replace beamforming in both ultrasound and a related imaging method called photoacoustic imaging. And then I'll describe our GAN approach as our first attempt to combine multiple images to or combine um, different networks to give multiple outputs from a single input. And then I'll end with my summary and outlook. So, as I mentioned, ultrasound is ubiquitous in the clinic. It can be used to visualize an array of different anatomical structures as shown here. There are several primary benefits of ultrasound over existing um, medical images that are used in the clinic today, such as it being safe, it doesn't require har uh, harmful ionizing radiation, it can be portable, it could fit in the clinician's pocket, it is cost effective, and it can provide real-time views of anatomy, as you see here with your very eyes. You're seeing the left ventricle of a beating heart of one of the uh, patients that I image. And it can also be used to provide both diagnostic and surgical information. Despite these many benefits, there have been several outstanding challenges that have persisted in the 60-year history of ultrasound images. So ultrasound images are known to be very noisy. They're known to contain a granular texture appearance known as speckle. They're known to attain, uh, uh, contain acoustic clutter, which basically causes signals to appear in regions where there should be none. And these images are known to suffer from poor sound attenuation at depth, as well as poor resolution as depth increases. And all of these challenges combine to make ultrasound images difficult to segment, difficult to interpret. At the heart of this long list of uh, challenges, is the fact that ultrasound images are generally considered to have poor quality in comparison to other imaging methods available in clinics today. So there have been several techniques over the history of the ultrasound imaging in the medical field to overcome challenges with poor image quality. For example, spatial compounding has been implemented to smooth out that granular appearance of the ultrasound images. 
Doppler imaging was introduced to image blood flow, which can potentially be extended to segment vessels of interest. We have harmonic imaging, which was introduced to reduce the acoustic clutter so that regions that should appear black actually appear black. However, there's a subset of patients where this technique does not always work. Then we have a method that I developed during my PhD, a coherence-based approach to imaging to reduce acoustic clutter, which works, in case, which works well in cases where harmonic imaging fails. As you can see in this example of the beating heart where there's a lot of clutter near the top of the left ventricle, and that clutter is reduced with the coherence-based approach to uh, beam forming the signals. And we also have a method that allows us to image the mechanical properties of tissue, as you can see here, where the uh, tumor is harder than the surrounding tissue, and sho so it shows up at a different, uh, with a different color. And this can also be extended to help with tumor segmentation. And then there are other methods as well that address some of the same challenges that these existing methods address. Uh, despite these techniques to overcome the long list of challenges here, none of them simultaneously address all challenges. And so this is what leads me to explore deep learning as a potential solution to simultaneously address this long list of challenges in one step. So the question I'd like to answer is, uh, how, can we use a no how can we transform a noisy, poor contrast image like the one shown here and use it to display uh, structures that might not show up very well, such as a needle tip. We wanna, I want to provide a more clearer indication about where the needle tip is located, and I can do this by overlaying the needle tip on the image or displaying uh, the needle tip by itself. Another example is that I'd like to use a deep neural network to transform a noisy, poor contrast image like this into uh, an image that only shows my structure of interest, and then I can add the same network that allowed me, uh, then I can add the same network that allowed me to detect the needle tip on, uh, in the example from the previous slide. And this is the idea and the concept for using deep learning to segment only the structures of image of interest and then combine different networks and allow us to get multiple outputs with a single step. And so this concept is the topic of my recently funded Trailblazer Award from the NIH. At the time that I proposed this concept and received this award, no one was thinking in this direction, so the award is appropriately titled. Successful implementation of this proposed approach would offer significant improvements over the current state of the field and overcome many of the challenges with poor image quality in a single image formation step. And so how do we actually do this? Well, I assume you know a lot about uh, uh, deep learning. So for the next part of the talk, I'll go more into, uh, into more detail about the beamforming process. So this is a standard ultrasound uh, system that's used in the clinic. The architecture is such that it contains three main components. The first is a scanner, which houses much of the electrical components of the system and also houses the computing um, hardware. Then we have an, a probe that's used to interface ultrasound images, uh, uh, that's used to be, uh, interface with the body and has a, an, a, range of, a range of different shapes and sizes depending on the body part being imaged. And then we have a monitor that's used to display the image on the screen. The way that these three components interact is, this, is that the scanner transmits electrical pulses to the ultrasound probe, which contains an array of piezoelectric elements that convert the electrical signals into mechanical pressure waves that are propagated into the body. These mechanical pressure waves then bounce off of, di bounce off of different structures in the body and create echoes that return to the probe that converts those same mechanical pressure waves into electrical signals with the piezoelectric elements housed in the probe. And those signals are then sent to the scanner, which receives the signals and sends them to an onboard computer for processing. The first step in the processing chain is beamforming. You can think of beamforming as the first line of software defense against a poor quality image. After beamforming, the signals undergo some more post-processing, such as scan conversion, log compression, and filtering, and finally the image is ready for display on the monitor. So why exactly is beamforming needed? To answer this question, let's take a closer look at the ultrasound probe that's used to interface with the body. This probe contains an array of piezoelectric elements, as you see here. 
The goal of these uh, piezoelectric elements is to transmit the mechanical pressure waves into the body. And so what is the shape of the beam that's transmitted into the body? Ideally, we want it to look something like this, where it's infinitely narrow as uh, depth increases. But due to the physics of wave propagation, we instead get something that looks like this, where it starts off narrow, but then it increases as depth increases. And so beam forming is our attempt to give us something that looks more like the ideal beam shape at a, a specific focal depth. And so how do we go from beam forming to images? Well, here again, we have the probe interface with the body. And we use a mathematical formulation to focus the beam, as shown on the previous slide. And we focus the beam at different locations along the aperture. And then we receive the echoes and build up an image line by line. And so in this concept, we transmit light. I mean, we transmit sound. And we get the image. And we can receive the sound and uh, perform the same concept uh, to focus the energy of the received signals on the receiving end as well as the transmit end. So we have both transmit and receive beamforming. Now with uh, this ultrasound imaging method, it may be difficult to detect uh, needle tips for the range of challenges that I introduced earlier, which are relisted here, uh, such as poor sound attenuation with depth and the way that the beam shape grows with depth, causing poor resolution with depth. And so one of the um, solutions that I'm exploring to address this challenge with needle tip detection is to transmit light instead of sound. And this transmission of light is called photoacoustic imaging or PA imaging. And so how is photoacoustic imaging uh, related to ultrasound imaging? Well, we take the same hardware that's used for ultrasound imaging, as you see here, and we add a laser to it. And this combination is called a photoacoustic imaging system. And then if we want to image our needle tip, that becomes our target. And so the goal is to uh, the goal of the technique is to transmit light toward our target, which would absorb the light, undergo thermal expansion, and generate a sound wave that we detect with conventional ultrasound transducers. And then once this sound wave is detected, all of the signal processing is very much similar to that of ultrasound, where the piezoelectric elements convert the mechanical pressure wave that's sensed into an electrical signal that then sends it to the scanner, and the scanner sends it to an onboard computer for processing. And the first step in that processing chain is, again, the very critical beamforming step. And then the signals might undergo some more post-processing. And finally, the photoacoustic image is ready for display on the monitor. Now, the nice thing about photoacoustic imaging being ultrasound imaging with a laser is that we can interleave ultrasound and photoacoustic images to improve the clinical experience. So I can determine where my needle tip is located with the assistance of the laser, um, and I can use the ultrasound image to provide detail about the anatomical structures as I'm guiding the needle to a structure of interest. And so finally, the mathematical formulation of beamforming um, is displayed in this concept where we can consider uh, for simplicity an ultrasound or a photoacoustic source that's simply a point source as shown here. Now the pressure waves that propagate toward the array of elements shown here uh, is sensed uh, by each element and we see that there is a, uh, a phase shift of these signals that are sensed relative to each other. And so we apply time delays to each channel in order to line the signals up and then we sum so that we get one signal that corresponds with the one source that created those multiple signals on the multiple channels. And so we apply this for each point along each scan line where the distance is related to, um, or the time delay is related to the distance that that source or that location is from the, receive, uh, from the particular receiver. And so that's the concept of beamforming in the receive, or receive beamforming. And so let's put this all together with a simulation. We have a point source propagating outward spherically toward our transducer. The transducer senses the signal on each of its elements, and we get a recording that looks like this, which we call our channel data, our raw channel data. We want to beamform this channel data in order for it to look like the source that created the, these, this recording. So we would ideally like it to look like this. But when we apply today's beamformers, we don't get something like, that looks like this all the time. We might instead get something that looks like this, 
where we don't have a perfect circle, there's some distortion of the shape, the, sh the source does not appear at the correct depth, and there's some artifacts to the left and right of the source. And so the reason why this happens is because of a fundamental flaw in the beamforming process. Current beamformers make assumptions about the wave propagation that are not always true. So for example, we need to apply time delays to each channel. And we know from physics that the time that needs to be applied is related to the distance of the source from the receiver through the speed of sound. One assumption that we make is that the speed of sound is constant. However, in reality, the speed of sound is not constant. It can change for different tissues, or different tissues have different speeds of sound, and the bulk speed of sound of a, within one patient is different from the bulk speed of sound in another patient. And so artifacts are produced when the acoustic environment significantly deviates from the assumptions that we make during the beamforming process. And this includes assumptions not only about the speed of sound, but also assumptions about there being constant density, or assumptions that there is a single path from the source to the receiver, when in actuality there could be multipath reverberations or there could be reflections. So let's take another look at what happens when we actually have a reflector in the field. So we have a single source and now something that reflects that source. The source propagates outward spherically, and when it encounters a reflection, it's very faint, but another uh, wavefront is produced. And when we make a recording, what, what we get is the uh, channel data that you see on the right. And when we beamform this channel data, the beamform the signals in the red box, we get this image in the larger red box. And what you can see from this image is that although we know from our simulation that there was only one source, uh, we get a recording that looks as if there are two wavefronts, and then when we beamform that, we see a, a source and an artifact in the image. Now this is the case for photoacoustic imaging or ultrasound imaging of a single point source. But when we make ultrasound images of tissue, our wave field looks very different. However, the same concept exists in that if you think of the, the tissue as containing multiple point sources, those point sources are superimposed on each other, and that's uh, what you get in the image on the top in the blue box. But then when you have reflections, say, from the ribs, you get additional wavefronts that are superimposed on the wavefronts from the pure tissue. And so we can think of artifacts as the mapping of signal sources to the wrong location. And this is the underlying reason for why uh, my lab is exploring a deep learning approach to beamforming. With this approach, our goal is to map the signal sources to the correct location. And a cartoon of the concept is shown here where we want to start with our raw channel data, pass it through a well-trained network, and classify each wavefront that's detected as a source or an artifact. And then we want to reformat the sources and artifacts classification into an interpretable image. And how do we do our training? Well, we train with simulations much like the ones that you saw on the previous slides. These simulations are intended to mimic the physics of wave propagation. And it, they can be done for both ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. And what exactly are we learning? Well, I started in this direction because you will notice from the simulations that sources that are closer to the receiver will have a different wave, wave front shape than sources that are farther away. And so what I believe uh, we are learning, at least with the photoacoustic example, is that unique shape to depth relationship. And it uh, remains an open question as to what the networks are interpreting when applied to ultrasound imaging. So let's uh, put this all together with a, a real clinical example, the case of ultrasound-guided biopsy, where a small tissue is removed for examination under a microscope, and ultrasound is used to guide the needle to the target of interest. And so one question we might want to know is, where is our needle tip? In some patients, it's very clear to see where the needle tip is located. In others, not so much, even though the same equipment and the same beamforming methods are being implemented. So wouldn't it be nice if we could know with confidence for all patients exactly where that needle tip is located as shown here? And we can do this with photoacoustic imaging by inserting an optical fiber in the core of the biopsy needle, and that allows us to generate a photoacoustic source at the needle tip. And so here's an example of the photoacoustic image that would be produced with this concept. 
And then it doesn't stop there. Because the image contains a lot of artifacts, we still need to apply segmentation to this image in order to localize the needle tip. And so one other point to consider is that this now becomes the task of a clinician finding a tiny source within the body. And so we can alleviate that task for the clinician and free the hands of the operator by attaching the ultrasound probe to a robot and asking the robot to search for that signal. And we tested this concept in my lab, and this is a, a picture of the setup, where we have an optical fiber inserted into a needle, and that needle and optical fiber setup is connected to a translation stage, which allows us to control the insertion of the needle into ex vivo uh, liver tissue. And then we have an ultrasound probe viewing the tip of the needle and attached to a robot arm. So let's look, a, look at a video of this system in action, which was published recently in scientific reports. So here, the needle is inserted into the, and advanced into the tissue. And we can see that the ultrasound probe follows the needle tip. And so it's making subtle motions to stay centered on the needle tip. And then we can override the robot's motion to find our biopsy target and then release, and the robot is able to recover the needle tip position again. And then if we transition to a view of what we see on the screen, we see the photoacoustic image it's very difficult for the segmentation algorithm to find the signal because initially there's poor SNR, but the robot continues searching until it finds the signal and then confidently centers the ultrasound probe on the needle tip. And so from this video, we can appreciate that artifacts are problematic, not just for us as humans interpreting the image, but also for robots. And so this provides additional motivation for a deep learning approach to image formation. And so with this motivation, unfortunately, deep learning is not an exact science, so it did require some trial and error. And so several networks were tested to implement this concept. And the one that we settled on and published uh, last year is the um, Faster RCNN network published in IEEE Transactions on Medical Imaging. And a uh, cartoon of the network architecture is shown here where we input our raw channel data sensed by the network, uh, sensed by the ultrasound transducer in simulation first to train the network. And our outputs, we have three outputs of interest. The first is a classification of the detected wavefront as a source or an artifact. The second is a bounding box location that tells us where the artifact is, or the source detected is located. And the third is a confidence score about the detection. And so we can also vary multiple parameters when training and testing our network. And here's an example of one of the parameters that's very relevant that was varied uh, first in simulation, and that's noise. So we start with a perfectly noiseless system, and then we add increasing levels of channel noise to the channel data. And here is an example result showing how the network performs for these multiple levels of channel noise. What we see is that uh, for no, the noiseless case and for low levels of noise, the network has a perfect accuracy with detecting both sources and artifacts, which are shown in shades of blue. The accuracy with detecting sources and artifacts are shown in shades of blue. And then as we get down to about negative 15 dB channel noise, it becomes uh, increasingly difficult for the network to maintain its accuracy. But what's remarkable about this result is that at 15 dB um, source accuracy, or at 15 dB channel noise, the accuracy is above 80%. And if you look at the image at 15 dB channel noise, it's very difficult for you and I to detect where that wavefront is located. And so as the channel noise increases, the accuracy with which we can detect sources and artifacts plummets and we start to see more missed sources and more missed artifacts, which are shown in shades of yellow. And this same concept is um, displayed in the ROC curves for the source on the top and the artifact on the bottom, where we have perfect detection in the noiseless and the minimal noise cases, and that detection degrades as the noise level increases. Another metric of interest is the location accuracy. How well can we determine where the uh, peak of the wavefront is located? 
And so what we see here is that we can measure this accuracy in the two image dimensions, in the axial dimension, which corresponds to the depth dimension, and in the lateral dimension, which corresponds to the direction of the arrays along the transducer. And ultimately, the take home message is that for multiple levels of channel noise, our accuracy is a submillimeter. It's about 0.1 millimeter in the axial dimension and 0.2 millimeters in the lateral dimension. And this is a remarkable result because if you consider the resolution of the imaging system, we're actually getting better resolution than the resolution provided with the beamforming methods uh, alone. And this is true at a range of noise levels as well as a range of depths. So this is very promising for the technique. I've shown you how we can vary noise, and there, were other, there are a host of other um, parameters that can be varied, um, which are listed here as an example, but I won't show those results in the interest of time. So we can vary, for example, the number of sources and artifacts, the speed of sound, as well as our ultrasound receiver model. And then once we have this well-trained network with all of these parameters varied, we can then transfer it to experimental data. And so here is a setup that we use to test our network on experimental data, where we have a phantom containing these brachytherapy seeds that look like point sources in this view of the ultrasound uh, probe. And then we can selectively illuminate which sources show up in the image by uh, pointing optical fibers at the sources. And so, for example, this photograph shows us selectively illuminating two sources, and this image on the right shows us what happens when we selectively illuminate three sources, the image on the left. And if we take a closer look at this image, what we see is that although we know that we selectively illuminated only three sources, we get four wavefronts in this experimental image. And when we beamform this image, we get something that looks like this, which looks as if there are four point targets, or four brachytherapy seeds in the image, but because we selectively illuminated three seeds, we know that only three should show up. However, the clinician relying on this image might not know that. And in fact, this could be very detrimental because these brachytherapy seeds are actually used to treat prostate cancer. And so it's very critical to get the location and the pattern of these seeds correct. And so what we want to do to help with that is to return to the raw data that created this image, replace the mathematical component of the image formation with the deep neural network that was trained to detect sources and reformat the outputs of the network into a usable image. And this image is an image that we call our CNN-based image, and it has no artifacts simply because we choose not to display them. It has arbitrarily high contrast because we choose the amplitude with which we want to display the detected sources. And it has high resolution at depth because the size with which we display the sources is related to the location accuracy measurements that we took when training and testing the network. And this is true uh, for, and the accuracy persists down to depths as large as eight centimeters as shown on this slide, where this time, this is an in vivo example that also was not included during training. And the setup is a little different in that we are navigating a cardiac catheter toward the heart and an optical fiber is inserted into the cardiac catheter. Uh, the goal is to illuminate the tip of the cardiac catheter, much like we wanted to see the needle tip. And so um, with the traditional beamforming methods, as we are um, moving this catheter back and forth, this is what uh, the image on the right shows what we get with today's beamforming method at such a deep depth. The resolution is very poor. And so our goal is to return to the channel data that created that image and bypass it through our network to determine exactly where the catheter tip is located, as you see here. And then we can also overlay the uh, detected, the CNN-based image on the traditional image to determine exactly where that catheter tip is located in the photoacoustic image. And so this is very promising for the technology, and it's, it, the, these Initial results are what led us to explore the possibility of applying similar approaches to ultrasound data. And so if we, t if we return back to the same clinical challenge of performing an ultrasound guided biopsy and instead ask ourselves, now where is that biopsy target? We can also appreciate that we can still attach the ultrasound probe to a robot and allow the robot to search for both the biopsy target and the needle 
but you can imagine that it needs both a, a good ultrasound and photoacoustic images in order to do this task. And it also needs to have real-time feedback of the ultrasound images and to be update, that feedback needs to be updated as fast as possible. For this reason, we choose one of the fastest methods available for performing ultrasound images, which is plane wave imaging. And in plane wave imaging, it requires the use of unfocused transmissions on all transmit elements with no delays. So as a reminder, for focused images, we focus our a group of elements into the body one at a time, and we receive the wavefront with each focused beam. With uh, unfocused or plane wave imaging, we just transmit on all elements at once. And the trade-off is that this provides poor image quality, but it provides really fast frame rates. And so here's an example of um, the raw channel data received from a single plane wave transmission. And we only use a single plane wave because we want to get the fastest, or we want to explore what's possible with the fastest frame rates that we can achieve. And so we only use a single plane wave transmission. And then if we beamform this image, it's a poor quality image. And if we segment it, we don't get the greatest segmentation. And so our goal is to take that same raw channel data and pass it through a trained network and achieve the ideal segmentation of that target. And so just like we trained our photoacoustic examples with uh, um, simulations, we can train our ultrasound um, networks with simulations as well. And here, our simulation training is such that we have a single cyst in tissue. Uh, we uh, train with anechoic, meaning that this cyst should return no echoes. So any echoes that are seen in the beamformed image is due to acoustic clutter. And then we train with a hypoechoic cyst, which is a low contrast, or which, which is a low contrast cyst that has amplitudes within the cyst that are slightly lower than the surrounding tissue. And then again, we just use a single plane wave, and we vary the multiple simulation parameters, such as the cyst radius between these values shown here, the speed of sound of the medium, and the axial and lateral location of the cyst. And then in testing, we can create a completely new data set that was um, randomly drawn from the multiple um, simulation parameters that were included during training, as well as having a um, amplitude uh, that ranges from anechoic to negative 6 dB. And so here's an example of a result from the test set that was not included during training. So this is our ground truth that we provide to the simulator, which gives us a raw channel data that looks like this. And then when we, when we apply beamforming, we get um, an image that looks like this, which you can see contains a clutter within the region that should be anechoic. Our goal then is to pass the raw channel data to the network that was trained in, uh, with the previous simulation um, sets, test uh, training sets, and get a CNN-based image that more clearly displays the structure of interest. And we know what that structure should be because we simulated it. And so we can compare our ground truth to the output of the network. And when we do that for this example, we get a dice similarity coefficient that's fairly high. And we can look at our dice similarity coefficients over the range of parameters that were tested, which we actually did in these publications shown here. And I'm just going to focus on cyst radius because it was the most interesting and it showed the most interesting uh, trends. And that trend is that uh, we could see that if we look at, we uh, appreciate that the x-axis shows a cyst radius and the y-axis shows the measured uh, dice similarity coefficient, and the red dots show the dice similarity for every cyst that was included during testing, and the blue line aggregates the results uh, by rounding to the nearest uh, integer multiple of the cyst radius, just to help us visualize that more clearly. And what we see is basically that the um, dice similarity coefficient degrades as the cyst gets smaller and smaller. And then when we transfer the trained network that was trained only with simulations to experimental phantom data, we see that for the phantoms that contain cyst sizes that are um, within the range of the simulated cyst sizes, we get a similar performance to what we get with the simulation test set. And so let's take a closer look as to what's happening with these smaller cysts. 
And so this apparent degradation in the dissimilarity coefficient is actually due to the coefficient measuring or penalizing uh, errors in smaller cysts more than errors in larger cysts. And so if we consider that our segmented image is shown here and the true segmentation is shown in red overlaid on this image, we can see that the dissimilarity coefficient is, is quite low, but the cyst size and shape are generally consistent with the ground truth. And so what this indicates is that it's very important for us as a community to choose appropriate um, metrics when we're evaluating the performance of our network. Because if our goal were to learn the number of cysts with a specific size, this network uh, would actually perform very well. But that is not our goal in this case, so we set out to explore how we can further improve the dissimilarity coefficients of these smaller cysts. And so this is what led us to think about including more features um, when training our network. And here, uh, this is what led us to explore a generative adversarial network. And so with this network, the more features that we want to include is learning not only the segmentation, but also the B-mode image. So we have essentially two outputs with a single input. And if we take a step back and look at what this network structure says, it tells us that we can actually combine uh, both image formation and image segmentation in a single step. And so this is what led me to think of more broadly about how can we as a community build these networks that take a single input and produce multiple outputs, because ultimately those multiple outputs are all based on the same raw data. And so this is the structure of our network in a little bit more detail. We have our RF channel data. We have a generator that produces both the uh, DNN image and the DNN segmentation. And then we have a discriminator. Uh, the goal of the generator is to trick the discriminator into thinking that the images are real. And then we have the, um, we combine the uh, DNN image and the DNN segmentation, along with the RF channel data that uh, creates the, the images into a single stack that we call the DNN stack. And that DNN stack is what's fed into our discriminator. And during training, we have a beamform stack, which essentially contains the same raw data. It contains the, uh, the true beam, the beamformed image from that raw data and it contains the ground truth segmentation that is included during training only. And the goal of the discriminator is to determine if the, the DNN stack or the prediction, it predicts whether the output from the neural network is real or fake. And as a reminder, this beamform stack is only included during training of the discriminator. And so one other point to consider as a community is that as we're building these networks, although currently there is no, um, there's a lot of trial and error, I'd like to see us move more toward understanding what the networks are doing and understanding whether the components and the modules that we are adding are actually necessary and how does that affect our evaluation metrics that we define based on the task of the network. And so to do this for this particular network, we realize that we can have two possible generators. One is that we can have a single encoder decoder structure that would enable us to share features among the two outputs. Or we can have two encoders and decoders that uh, one is trained to produce only a DNN image and does not share features with the other one that's trained to produce the DNN segmentation. And then we can also ask ourselves whether the discriminator is necessary. And so this allows us to have a total of four networks two with discriminator, two without, two with a single encoder decoder, so it has feature sharing, and two that does not have feature sharing. And so this is a quantitative summary of our performance. What we see are three insights from this systematic study. The first is that uh, if we look at the networks with the discriminator, the discriminator improves the segmentation of the small cyst, which is what we set out to do. So it indicates to us that it was helpful. The second point to note is that feature sharing improves our PSNR. And um, this leads us to conclude that the network with both the discriminator and the feature sharing is the most ideal. And so if we return back to this plot and just strip it away, 
uh, strip away all of the other uh, information except the information um, that aggregates the results by integer multiple of the radius. And we compare this result that we had previously to the result that we get with our GAN approach, we see that we achieved our goal of slightly increasing uh, the dissimilarity coefficient that we see for the smaller cis. So we consider that a success, and if we see some examples of what uh, this network actually looked like, so not just looking at quantitative summaries, uh, here are some actual examples. This is our raw data. This is what we get when we beamform the image with the delay and sum beamforming. And what you see that just showed up are the two outputs of the GAN. And we can compare the beamformed image to the output of the GAN and the input segmentation that was, or the ground truth segmentation, I should say, to the um, output of the GAN, the DNN segmentation output of the GAN. And what we see is that we have a fairly high PSNR as well as a fairly high DSD. And this is our simulation result. And when we look at our experimental result, so this is the experimental phantom, that was the little green dot on all of the curves that you saw previously throughout this section, we see uh, in comparison, uh, we qualitatively get something that looks like the delay in sum image and something that looks like the ground truth segmentation, although the results are both visibly and quantitatively lower. And then um, despite the, um, well, just keep in mind that these are just preliminary results that do provide confidence for us to explore this pr approach further. And we are very excited by these results, as well as, uh, so these results were published earlier this year. And since then, we've had some newer modifications to our network that produce results that look like this, which are also equally exciting. And they're exciting because it indicates to us that now we can have three outputs from a single input. The first is that we can produce the ultrasound image as is. The second is that we can produce a smoother version of the ultrasound imaging, of the ultrasound image, which is uh, similar to what the spatial compounding introduction to improve image quality has done over the years of the ultrasound imaging history. And we can provide a segmentation. So we have three in one, three outputs from one input. And so um, although I've shown you how we can learn um, uh, segmentation the outputs of the network are not just limited to segmentations or images. There is a list of other um, outputs that we can learn and that have been learned over the years, where the colors on this plot indicate the years, the short uh, three-year history, two to three-year history of this field. And the um, x-axis shows the number of publications that have actually learned these different outputs from the raw input as data and the list on the left indicates the different outputs. The list on the right indicates the different outputs. No, your left. <laughs> um, so the different outputs are uh, high quality raw data, uh, compressed raw data. We can take raw data as input and learn a segmentation map as we're doing. We can also take uh, raw data as input and learn the speed of sound map as well as high quality ultrasound images. We can learn elasticity images and we can learn both the segmentation map and a B-mode image. And I'm pleased to see that many of my colleagues around the world are implementing these different approaches, and so I just think that there's a lot of promise for the field, and I'd like to encourage us to continue thinking in this direction. And the, where our work fits in is here and here, where we are exploring how we can learn a segmentation map from the raw data. And our work and our approach is different from those shown here because we take the single, uh, we take the raw data from a single plane wave transmit. We do not apply any time delays, and our goal is to in turn that into an interpretable, usable image uh, in the format of a segmentation. As far as I'm aware, our group is also the first, or the, the only ones, as far as I'm aware, and the first to think about combining multiple outputs are producing multiple outputs from a single input. So this graphic alone uh, provides the evidence, I believe, to say that we are entering a new age of ultrasound image formation, and it's very exciting, and I believe that there's a lot of possibilities to explore. I believe it's such a young field, and there's a lot of different directions that can be taken. 
And so my outlook is that uh, we still are suffering from many of the classical challenges uh, with uh, deep learning in that we uh, require training sets that include multiple possible patient variations. We um, need to think about generalizability for the specific tasks that I'm interested in. Uh, we want to learn circular cysts, but of course, all targets in the body are not circular, so we want to be able to generalize our networks to other structures. Um, uh, I think network interpretability, I know there's a group of us in, within this community that's working on this very topic, and I believe that this is very important even for the field of medical imaging with deep learning. And I also want to drive home the point that our evaluation metrics should very much be tied to the specific imaging task, and we shouldn't just draw from the same evaluation metrics that the general like, vi computer vision community uses. We should think about additional metrics that are useful for our community. And then I believe that this work just shows promise that we can get multiple outputs from a single input with feature sharing that's not just limited to ultrasound imaging, but could, could potentially be applied to other forms of medical imaging as well. Because other, image, other medical imaging techniques can provide multiple outputs or, and do provide multiple outputs from the, single, from the same raw data that's measured by the like, MRI or CT scanner. So I encourage us to think in that direction as well. And if we think about the list that I showed earlier as a roadmap of major advances in ultrasound where I discussed that we had uh, spatial compounding, harmonic imaging, elasticity imaging, coherence-based imaging, and Doppler imaging, I believe that deep learning, a deep learning approach to beam forming and image formation will be one of the next major advances within this field. And so as a summary, um, with advances provided by deep learning, both ultrasound and photoacoustic images can be presented in a novel format that extracts information directly from the raw channel data. I've shown that we can have a one-step approach to address historical challenges with image quality. So no longer just a one, a one uh, approach for one challenge. We can address a, the long list of challenges with a single deep neural network is my vision. And so I've shown in this talk how we can address the challenges of reflection artifacts, segmentation, speckle, and clutter with a single network, potentially. And there are also others that can be addressed as well. And our initial results and those of my colleagues around the world uh, highlight the capabilities of deep learning for both ultrasound and photoacoustic image formation. And I believe that there are a lot of exciting possibilities ahead. And the results that I show are promising not just for us as humans reading the images, but also for robots uh, to perform more autonomous imaging tasks, such as autonomous surgery. And so as a broader overview of what my lab does, we take theories, models, and we develop theories and use models and simulations like the one shown here to design beamformers for both ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. We also design imaging probes, such as this specialized light delivery system shown here. And our goal is to uh, build and test prototypes with these designs that will ultimately improve image quality. And then we incorporate these designs and combine them with commercially available systems, like the ultrasound system, the robot, or the laser shown here. And together, it creates a new system that's the first of its kind to address a clinical challenge. And then we take that system and test, the, test it on patients treated at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And then we might learn something from our clinical studies that would require us to revisit our theories, models, and simulations. And the cycle would continue from there. And then I have two announcements. The first is that my lab is hiring postdocs in this area, so if you're interested, please do come and speak to me or reach out to me via email. And then second is that I'm guest editing a special issue in one of the most highly regarded ultrasound journals in our field. And I encourage anyone working in this field to submit their work to this journal and this special issue of the journal, Deep Learning in Medical Ultrasound. And I would be remiss to end this talk without uh, thanking my large team for making this work possible and my funding sources. And finally, I thank you all for your attention.
Thank you for the talk. Uh, we have time for questions. It's hard to see from here, uh, but don't be shy. If Yeah, so there's a question there. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so uh, since we, uh, it, it's, uh, I agree that it's really important in, to use uh, deep learning in ultrasound. And uh, since we started the talk about uh, how uh, dynamic focusing or beamforming is uh, fundamentally having a flaw about uh, assumptions in speed of sound, uh, Maybe it's uh, maybe it's more interesting to see if uh, if by by using delay and sum and then using generating a data set of out of this uh, using this delay and sum and then doing the segmentation and comparing it with doing it directly from the raw data because then we will know if this assumption is really uh, dragging us behind if, uh, from doing actual segmentation. Maybe if uh, uh, can shed some light on that. Yeah, so my thoughts on that are that, um, so I approached this problem because prior to um, entering this field, my background and expertise is ultrasound imaging. And as part of my PhD, I spent a great deal of time understanding the sources of image quality degradation in ultrasound images. So there's a great body of research that already indicates that the speed of sound errors that we see is one of the major sources of ultrasound image de degradation. So we already know that in terms of image quality. And image quality is what drives segmentation. If we have a poor image quality, we're going to have a poor segmentation. Um, there's no way to get around that. So those are my thoughts on that topic. Thanks a lot. I think there's a question on the, on the upper left there. Thank you for a great talk. Um, when you use your setup at the highest resolution at this moment, could you elaborate on what is the computational uh, performance you need in terms of like operations per second on the device that is processing these images in real time? Yeah, that's a good question. So you mean like when we, when we put our raw data into the network and output the image, do th the images provide real time essentially the equivalent of what we would get with real-time frame rates. Yes. And the answer is yes, they do. So for example, for our photoacoustic images, we were able to get frame rates in the, on the order of 14 frames per second, which is great for the setup that we have because our laser only fires at 10 hertz. So we're actually able to update faster than our laser can fire. And similar performance is achieved for the ultrasound networks as well, although I don't remember the frame rates off the top of my head. But they are available within our publications. And can you comment on what hardware are you using to compute? Oh, um, we use a range of GPUs from NVIDIA. So we have a Titan Black uh, GPU. We have a Titan XP GPU as well. So th that's what drives the, the learning and the output <coughs> of our networks. Thank you. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, can you comment on extending this to either fetal or cardiac? Yeah, that's a good question because I just showed cysts, right? Because our our approach is like these interventional techniques that are, you know would use biopsies, but there's nothing really unique about the fact that we're training cysts in the sense that if uh, we are interested instead with a, uh, we're interested instead in fetal or cardiac imaging, then to me that would just indicate that we would just need to change our simulations to train with models that mimic the cardiac structure or the fetal structure. And I believe that we should be able to achieve similar benefits in, a, after making that modification. OK, thank you. So there's a question at the front there on the left. Hi, 
thank you for the great talk. Um, I see that you have some continuous outcome variables like uh, location and radius. I wonder how, uh, if you have any advice on regression networks versus classification networks, i.e. the uh, regression head or classification layer uh, for those variables. Um, say that again, please. I didn't hear the full question, so maybe could you try so speaking I louder? That, I see that you have uh, continuous variables like location and radius uh, being predicted by the networks. I wonder if you have an advice for the technical audience about the regression, about regression networks versus classification networks. That means uh, having regression heads to predict those variables versus oh, classification. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So those, th that can be used as well. And in fact, in that uh, group of papers that I cited, there are some that are using those kind of networks instead, and they're able to achieve a different type of image, but it, it's an image that meets their criteria for what they want to learn. So it's certainly possible, and others are also doing it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. We have a question here at the front. Uh, Barry, just, just here. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. And if we read the textbook of, of ultrasound imaging, there are so many equations. That is the physical equations. And in the beam forming, using a deep learning, so what kind of physical models are created? So, you know, if you read the textbook, side lobes and, you know, beam focusing, so many things, the Fraunhofer zone and the other, et cetera. So what kind of physical models are created by using a deep learning? So, yeah, that's a great question. So what I what what we're what we're doing is we're not um, saying we're not we don't want to throw away the physics, but we incorporate all of the physical models that have already been in, uh, created and used to make ultrasound simulations. So to answer the question as to what physical models are we using, we're using the same physical models that the simulations are based on, and our goal is then to learn and extract only the structures that we care about from the simulations that, are, uh, that create data that are based and rooted in the physics. Thanks. If there's a last burning question. Uh, yeah, so there. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, for the physical models, I think you have guarantees, but how would you trade the offset you get from the bias by learning from data? compared to the error in the models? Um, so how to create, how to I account mean, for an offset bias? And so the only bias would be if the uh, model that the simulation, well, I would say the primary, not the only, but the primary mo uh, bias would be the error uh, if, or if the s physics that the simulator is based on does not incorporate all of the possible acoustic uh, wave uh, propagation variables based on physics. And so that, I believe, would be one of the primary sources of error with our approach. And then there could be a, just additional sources because the network hasn't quite learned the uh, physical models as it should. And so um, I guess currently the field accounts for that second source of error by including more training data. And so I would suggest to include more training data to account for that error and to account for the first error. We would just need better simulators so that we are accurately simulating the physics of wave propagation or at least simulating to a first order uh, effect where we are able to produce images that provide enough information for us to trust and for that error to be low. The out, for us to trust the output of the network and for that error to be sufficiently low for us to achieve our desired task. Because all of this is task-based. Like what might work for one task might not necessarily work for another task. So the goal is to have our, mo our models and our um, simulators be good enough to achieve whatever that specific task, but it's important for us to define what that task is from the beginning. OK, thanks. Oh. Thanks. So I think that. Um, Having the take home message of, of really understanding the task we're trying to solve and, and really understanding the physics of, of image acquisition to feed that into our, our work uh, is a great one to finish. Uh, so let's thank the speaker.